Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. I'm your host, Jarrett Blanion. Today, we're joined by Anne McLeod of the Private Essential Access Community Hospitals. Anne, how's it going? Thanks for joining us. It's going great. Thanks for having me. Hey, no worries. I'm, I'm just glad I got that out. You know, long <laughs> acronym, PEACH, <laughs> PEACH Hospitals. Kind of, can you tell us what, what is PEACH Hospitals? Yeah, because the name does not really describe who we are. It's, it's, it's so, uh, kind I'll of kind mouthwatering of, though. Yeah. So what I like to say is we are the community safety net hospitals, but let me kind of put that in perspective. There are about 440 hospitals in the state of California serving people north, south, east, west, urban, rural, everything in between. About 100 or so of those, maybe 90-ish, um, have a special designation from the federal government as being a hospital that serves a disproportionate share of essentially the vulnerable population, those on the Medi-Cal program, mm -hmm. the poor and disenfranchised, that aren't public hospitals. Everybody has heard of, oh, you go to the public hospital, you go to the county hospital if you don't have insurance. Well, there are only 21 public hospitals that serve 15 counties. And as you know, California has 58 counties. Right. So somebody's filling in the gap. Those are these community safety net hospitals that have that federal designation. So let's say I get hurt. I don't have insurance. I go to Sutter. Mm -hmm. I walk in there. And I say, I need help. I'm bleeding from my head. And I don't have insurance. What do they do? They have to take care of you. They have to take care of you. Because okay. every hospital in California, especially entering through an mm. emergency room, they have to provide you know life-threatening right. care to you if you need it. They may then um, ask you to follow up at a hospital in your hometown if, mm. if you you know didn't live right and by them. And I just them. don't pay the bill. Yeah. And they won't like that. But okay. um, so you may get referred to um, go see a physician. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have insurance, it's going to be a hard time finding a physician. So ultimately, you find a physician and you find that he practices at one of these community safety mm -hmm. net hospitals because the community safety net hospitals make sure that they have physicians available to help care for folks that don't have insurance, yet they should have insurance, but or at least are on the Medi-Cal program. So basically, I'd bounce around until I found yes. one of your hospitals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so what if what if I just won one of your facilities in the first place? Yeah, they would love it. That's, <laughs> that's uh, you know, and that's the difference between a community safety net hospital mm -hmm. versus a community hospital. All, all hospitals are great, and they will care for anybody and provide life-threatening care. But the community safety net hospital, they make it their mission to serve the poor and disenfranchised. Um, we talked earlier about um, county hospitals being kind of the default, the de facto, where uninsured mm -hmm. people go or poor people go. They're mandated to serve the poor. That's their yeah. mandate. So they serve by mandate. The community safety net hospitals, they serve by mission. They choose to be in these communities. They don't get special county public funding. They just choose to serve as part of their mission, right. disenfranchised communities. Hospitals are like kind of fascinating to me because they're such a unique world. You have the religions in them, right? The Catholics, the Adventists own some hospitals. You have Kaiser, a former steel company who owns a bunch of hospitals. You have Sutter. Kind of what is, what is the world of hospitals? Who are the owners? Who are the players? So um, everything that you just said, mm -hmm. a lot of the hospitals, probably a little over half are not nonprofit, not for profit. Um, most of those are part of a system. And you mentioned a few like Adventist is a system that really focuses on the safety net. Dignity Healthcare really focuses on the safety net. Then there are systems that are not so focused on the safety net. Some of those that you might have heard of, like the Sutter system and Kaiser Mm -hmm. um, they generally don't have safety net hospitals. And then you also have a lot of independent standalone hospitals that don't have the support of a broader system. We see more of those um, like down towards Los Angeles area um, because the communities are so widespread mm -hmm. there. So you see a lot of those. Some of those are owned by investors, but those investors choose to have that hospital serve that low-income population, not all investor hospitals are bad and out-for-profit. They really are mission-driven. Right. And then you also have um, some of the community hospitals um, like up north of Sacramento towards the Oroville Dam. You have Oroville Hospital. That's an example of a rural community safety net hospital that chooses to serve the poor, and it's not part of a system. So it's really wide-ranged who, who is a peach hospital mm -hmm. who's a community safety so net. you said there's like 400 hospitals yeah. statewide 
Um, how many of those are nonprofit versus for profit? What's the percentage split there? Um, it's a little over half are nonprofit, maybe even close to two thirds. And then you've got out of the rest of those, you've got um, quasi government hospitals. Mm -hmm. So they're either county owned um, or we have this thing in California called hospital districts or healthcare districts, actually. And many of those healthcare districts own and operate a hospital. So you have that government um, element of it. Then the rest of the hospitals, um, some of them are just owned by like a private uh, physician or a group of physicians. There aren't that many of those, but there are some. Mm. There are some that are parts of um, large um, uh, investor-owned systems. Some of the ones you might have heard are like tenant healthcare. Yeah. Um, but actually most of those hospitals are safety net hospitals That's too. Amazing. And then you have another, um, for profit system like HCA healthcare of America. I think they're I, what it stands for. I think they're based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, they don't have any community safety net hospitals in California, but, um, so it's, it's, it's pretty broad. So this is like fascinating. I remember like during COVID, there was like this whole thing about like, oh, we're all going to be in the hospital. We don't have enough beds. And they like, you know, got a battleship out here and they had Arco Arena full of beds and <laughs> I know, ended up never, never using them. But I guess when you think about it, if we have 400 hospitals, we have 40 million people. Uh, I guess we don't really have enough hospitals for all the people. How do they decide kind of how often a, a hospital needs to be? Like I, I know like fire stations need to be every, you know, so far apart. Yeah. Is, is that the same thing for hospitals or? No, they got no. rid of that a long time ago in California. I think back in the seventies, it was actually called certificate of need. Mm -hmm. And they used to assess what was needed. Was an MRI needed in this community? Was a CT scanner needed in this community? Were more beds needed in this community? And that was done away with. And it's pretty much just been market driven since. But you bring up a really important point about uh, you know, a state of almost 40 million people, and we've got, you know, 400 and some odd hospitals. Um, California is the second lowest state in the country that has beds per thousand population available. Mm. So during COVID, when we were all full, we were full. Right. Um, and a, just a little side note, the community safety net hospitals, um, during COVID, the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services designated certain hospitals as being high COVID providers because they were really taking on the masses. 41% of those were the community safety net because we also saw that COVID really hit those communities the hardest. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget. Um, in 2020, I think it was like June of 2020, we had Carmela Coyle on talking about hospitals and COVID. And she said that, you know, you know, she laid out the path of when we'd start getting back to normal. And she said it was like 2023. And we were like, what? And it, it was exactly it. It was like, you yeah. know, now here we are, 2024, things are basically coming back to what semi normal, but it was just so, you know, crazy those three yeah. years. And, you know, kind of yeah. how did they impact kind of your your peach hospitals? Horribly. Um because they entered the pandemic on a much different level than non-safety net hospitals. Because they are a safety net hospital and they care for the poor, as you can guess, they get a whole lot less money mm -hmm. because um, on average for a community safety net hospital, 85 to 90% of their patients are government funded. So they're paid by either the Medi-Cal program or the Medicare program, which are the elderly. And but the Medicare program has a component of it. They're called Medi Medi, and those are the poor elderly people. Mm -hmm. They get both Medi-Cal and Medicare, and that really makes up the composition of the patients in the community safety net hospital. So ninety percent of their patients, they just get what the government pays them, either the state government or the federal government, mm -hmm. and they've got a small little sliver, nine or ten percent. Um, where they do have some commercial contracts where people like you and I that have commercial insurance, you know, we can go and right. get the care we need. Um, and what you'll find if you look at the non-safety net hospitals, they have a much wider um, a range of commercially covered patients that they serve. And on average, those hospitals make about a 60% margin 
on those patients. Right. Um, the community safety net, they get a little bit smaller margin, more like 35 or 40, which sounds like a lot, a big margin, but it's on a tiny slice because on those government funded patients, they're taking a negative 35% margin for caring for them. Wow. And so they make a little bit up on the commercial side. So what that meant going into COVID, these are the kind of hospitals that don't have large reserves, don't have a lot of income, don't have anything to fall back on. Cash flow is always, you know, paycheck to paycheck, you know, kind of payroll to payroll. Very different than the non-safety net type of hospitals and more affluent communities. Mm -hmm. Granted, COVID was hard on everybody because everybody quit going to the hospital. So the revenue stream dried up. But here's the other, here's the other thing that made it really difficult for the safety net hospitals. The federal government actually really came through in, in Congress passing laws that created COVID relief for hospital and um, some of the funding that was available. But here's where it fell short. The basis for the funding that they sent to hospitals, they, they didn't know what to base it on. So they just came up with this and they said, whatever your revenue was, that's how we're going to distribute the funding pro rata. So the hospitals that had big insurance company payouts and ex lucrative contracts, mm -hmm. they got most of the COVID money. And the safety net hospitals got a whole lot less. Right. So during COVID, they're straining just like everybody else. They're paying the same high, uh, increased pharmaceutical cost, the huge cost for labor because, you know, the nursing shortage and needing more nurses. It was, they had nursing contracts where they were paying 200, 250 bucks an hour for a nurse through traveling companies mm -hmm. just so that they could keep staffed. Wow. So they had to pay those same prices for supplies and pharmaceuticals and staffing, yet they didn't get as much money through the COVID relief as the, the more affluent hospitals in more affluent communities did. So COVID just ravaged them. And um, our little community of community safety net hospitals, like 90 or so of them, as I said, um, three quarters of them were losing money during COVID. Um, and even last year, those hospitals lost $864 million. Now, in contrast, I might get in trouble by saying this. I'm not really supposed to say this and point it out, but I can't help it. So you take the, you take the universe of safety net hospitals. Mm -hmm. They lost $864 million last year. Then you take the opposite universe, which is non-safety net hospitals. They made $3.2 billion wow. last year. So... Um, while things may be back to normal for a lot of hospitals, um, our hospitals are still struggling. So how, how do these hospitals afford to keep going if they just keep losing money? Like, obviously, we just kind of went over the math, right? We, we need more hospitals, not less. And so how do we keep the lights on in these facilities and, and encourage more to be built if the mathematics aren't there for them to operate? So, and that's a dilemma we're facing. And I'm sure you've heard of the Madeira Hospital that closed. It was a community safety net hospital, Beverly Hospital in Los Angeles that essentially closed down but was immediately reopened under another hospital's license that saved them. That was a community safety net hospital. There were at least a half a dozen hospitals that went through bankruptcy last year. They were community safety net hospitals. Um, there just hasn't been the relief. Fortunately for some of them, um, they were able to partner or get loans. There have been some Medi-Cal managed care plans like LA Care is one of the really good ones that offered advances mm -hmm. to some of these hospitals to kind of keep them afloat, kind of, you know, bridge them some cash ahead of time. Um, we were on the phone constantly with the Medi-Cal department, Department of Healthcare Services, and other health plans saying, can you please advance some funding that's coming to them? We have certain... Um, supplemental funding streams in the Medi-Cal program and they pay in arrears like sometimes two years in arrears wow. and luckily there was um, a couple of tranches of that funding that was due and we just worked with the folks that were paying those out and we said can you please pay you know this out early so it accelerated some cash flow and it got them through the times until people kind of started coming back to the hospital mm -hmm. and the cash flow started to be more normal. It's interesting, though, the revenue, um, the revenue has come back to what it was, uh, which wasn't that much. 
but the expenses never went down. Yeah, I was going to say, like, we've had this great <laughs> yeah. inflation, right? So everything's yeah. more expensive. The they expenses just didn't passed go a down. bill that says you have to pay everyone, what, 25 bucks an hour? 20 bucks an hour. Um, yeah. But isn't there one for, like, healthcare work or something? There was some bill where they, they even have Oh, yeah, $25 minimum. an hour, yeah. Um, and and it, it, it goes up step by step right. depending on what type of hospital you are and stuff. So that's going to add $8 billion to the um, healthcare cost structure. Um, the Medi-Cal payments that the com- that all hospitals, because all hospitals treat Medi-Cal patients, but it's my community safety net hospitals that serve the disproportionate share. That's what they mm-hmm. they rely on that because they don't have the big insurance company contracts. They um, they haven't received an increase from the state of California in 13 years. So how, how does this work out? Like they keep expanding coverage, right? Yes. They keep yes. Guess, expanding the the costs onto you guys, right? And yet, on the other yeah. hand, they don't. Which is why three fourths of the them money. are now losing money. And so, what we saw during COVID, you know, the the Madeira and the Beverly mm. and the bankruptcies. Yes, we've kind of um, gotten our feet back under us a little bit now, but this is not sustainable. Something has to change. But what, but what really has to change, because I can talk about hospital finances all day long, but what I think is really important is looking at the communities that my co- community safety net hospitals serve. Mm-hmm. They serve the poor communities, the disenfranchised, those 15 million folks on Medi-Cal are half of them are served by the safety one third net of hospitals. our state, right? Yeah, wow. one third of our state, and it's served by the safety hospitals. net hospitals um, who haven't received a raise in thirteen years. So yes, crying for the hospitals because that's horrible, horrible business conditions mm-hmm. to be in. But who suffers? The patients, the communities. So let's talk about how they suffer. You and I, we have commercial insurance. Let's say, you know, we're walking across the street together. We get hit by a car. We both have our legs broken. Horrible, tragic story, right? right? But they haul us off to our hospitals and we have our insurance. We immediately see an orthopedist. We probably immediately have surgery and we get the follow-up care we need and we're on the mend. You get this giant bill in the mail. And And your insurance company pays for it, right? So you're on the Medi-Cal program. And, you know, you get hit in your impoverished community where you live and you have this hospital who serves you. So you get taken to that hospital and they take you to the ER and they call an on-call orthopedist and they have to pay that orthopedist. The orthopedist doesn't bill you, they bill the hospital Mm -hmm. and they get you the care they need. But your surgery might not be scheduled for a couple of more days because they don't have multiple orthopedists. Right. And this guy or girl has to go and serve a lot of other communities and hospitals. So your surgery might delayed. Your follow-up care might be delayed. You might not have the same outcome. That person may not have the same outcome that you and I had because we got care when we needed it, fast, mm-hmm. and, and we were taken care of optimally. Um, Are they being taken care of optimally? You know, everybody is doing their best, but sometimes time is of the essence. If you're... um, I imagine if you're the best orthopedist too, you're probably not putting yourself in that situation. You're not going to South Central LA, Uh. you know? And, um, And, you know, and the hospital has to pay folks to get them there, and it's not like they still want to come. So what what this results in is inequitable health care. Just like hospitals are the haves and have nots right. and communities are haves and have nots, the Medi-Cal population really has not the same level of health care that other people have. And that's driven by one point only, that the resources aren't being directed to those that need the most. And it goes back to, you know, the whole conversation about how hospitals get money and everything else. And because we're in the Sacramento area, I'm going to pick on like Roseville. You go to Roseville and they got, you know, fancy cars and Teslas Mm -hmm. and Mercedes and the moms driving their Suburbans around with the kids in it. And you've got a couple of big fancy hospitals over there and everything. There's a lot of money in that community, big shopping malls. Um, There are three times the health care resources spent in that community than there is in an impoverished community in Los Angeles. 
or even some in the Central Valley, like around the Fresno area, where there are a lot of farm workers and agricultural areas, three times the resources. So they have three times the money to buy the CT scanner with the most slices, the fanciest MRI, three orthopedists instead of a half a one twice a week. Right. Um, and so the level of care that people receive is different. And I'm not okay, nor should the people of California nor the legislature be okay with funding Medi-Cal so irresponsibly. Yeah, it's kind of a uh, kind of bizarre, right? They just like keep expanding things without, yeah, I guess questioning yeah. whether you know what's the end result, right? What's yeah. the oversight on actually what they're doing and and the end result of actually yeah. affecting patients? Now, this is something we've you know talked. You know, it was really big in 2008, right, when Obama was being elected. Obamacare, uh, a mandate to have insurance. How is, has that changed anything in your opinion? Um, it's been, it's what? put more people on the Medi-Cal program. I think that folks were thinking that there would be a lot more people enrolled in covered California and they'd have all this commercial insurance. Right. Um, but really what we saw was, um, a huge expansion of Medi-Cal, which is good because it's better to have Medi-Cal than have nothing. Um, we saw Medi-Cal grow from pre-ACA of about 6 million people to today, ACA being the Affordable Care yeah. Act, to now being almost 15 million people. And the rates that are being paid are the same as they were back then. Sure, there's volume, but if I'm losing 35 cents on the dollar on every patient, I'm not making it up in volume. Right. Um and there has been no new money allocated to the Medi-Cal program for hospitals um, in 13 years. Yes, there have been things. Um, the big talk last year in healthcare was this MCO tax. Have you heard of the MCO tax? Yeah. yeah. So they're like, oh, we're going to do this MCO tax. So um, that's all well and good. But there was a basically $5 billion, I'm rounding, and somebody will say this and say, oh, she got the numbers wrong. I'm rounding. I'm giving you perspective and rounding. The MCO tax, um, state funds were about $5 billion. And yes, most of those get matched with federal funds. But rather than doubling everything, I'm just going to talk about state, state funds, about $5 billion. It's a little less. I think it's 4.65. But no, the governor went back and asked for more. But So let's just say five. And everybody got a piece of the pie. The state got the biggest piece of the pie for the general fund because of the budget condition that they're in. Well, but, you know, others are having a budget condition too. So normally hospitals get one third of the healthcare dollar. So there were a few buckets in the MCO tax for hospitals, but they were special buckets like this was some uh, graduate medical education. So that goes to the UCs for teaching. Very important, but it doesn't go to all the hospitals. And there was a special little bucket for just the public hospitals. Very important for them. But, you know, the 400 hospitals across the state, they aren't getting part of that bucket. The only bucket that the 400 other hospitals in the state got um, two buckets that totaled 300 million. And when those got federally matched, say it was 600 million. So you got 400 hospitals splitting 600 million. That's what, about a million and a half per hospital? Right. That That's not groundbreaking or life-saving or keeping the doors open. Um, while I know folks are grateful that there was an MCO tax, um, it did not proportionately get new money to hospitals specifically for Medi-Cal um, at all to the rate that it should. So that did very little to save. And the governor during the stress of everything also put forth a distressed hospital fund. I don't know if you remember that. No. It was big in the news when Madeira, because mm. when Madeira closed. So he created this fund of $150 million that hospitals could apply for. Well, I guarantee every one of my hospitals applied for it, and I think there were about a dozen loans made, and I think only a couple of my guys got it um, because they were excluded because of the criteria right. that would have excluded them. So, I mean, while it's wonderful to have these programs, they were not far-reaching or deep enough to be helpful. So um, the problem just still exists and hasn't been fixed, and the ones suffering really are the people on the Medi-Cal program. Right. Um, homelessness. Yes. Uh, 
Lots of homeless out there. Big yeah. issue. Uh, yeah. Audit just came out. A lot of money being spent. I know. Um, apparently not going to maybe hospitals that yeah, <laughs> treat these not. homeless people all the time. Kind of what's the story with the homeless and kind of... Yeah, it's hospitals? really difficult. Um, it's a difficult part of the kind of demographic of that our hospitals take care of. And the safety net hospitals actually care for more than half of the homeless patients in the state. And... Um, the, the state has this um, data entity, it's called HCI, um, that collects data from hospitals and they collect zip codes from patients and all this other. And through that, you're able to ascertain how many of those patients are actually homeless because they didn't have zip code, um, you know, was mm -hmm. one thing. Because there's not a, bo a box that says homeless or not homeless, but if they don't have an address and a zip code, well, then they're probably homeless. So you're able to look at this and ascertain where did those homeless people get their care. And over half of the homeless population got their care in these safety net hospitals. Um, homelessness is one of the major indicators of health um, and, and socioeconomic status. And if you're homeless, that's really low on the socioeconomic status mm -hmm. ability. Um, and if you mix with that having maybe um, a behavioral health or mental health condition or a substance use condition, those are the most socially complex individuals in the state. And our hospitals take care of half of them. Um, and they don't get paid for it. I mean, not for their complexity. There, the way hospitals get paid, all hospitals get paid for Medi-Cal patients is based on the medical acuity. So if you're a hospital and I'm a hospital and we both get a patient with appendicitis, they say that's an acuity of X and we both get paid X plus the acuity. Mm -hmm. But my patient was homeless and had all these uh, complicating conditions. So their their social complexity was off the scale, yet that had nothing to do with their medical complexity. I got the same amount of money. But studies show that patients with the highest social socioeconomic complexities, social complexities, um, stay in the hospital longer, need more care, because where do you discharge them? There's no family, there's no home, there's no community care, there's no anything. And so it consumes a lot more resources. But because you're only paid on the acuity, not how long the patient stays, we both get the same amount of money. So again, me, the safety net hospital, it's often called a safety net penalty for caring for the poor because they have all these social complexities that don't get worked into the calculation. That's one of the things, you know, um, we actually had a proposal to pay the safety net hospitals, have an add-on payment to their Medi-Cal right. payments for a social complexity, not just the medical acuity. And I was in the Capitol on the last day that it was open. It was in the afternoon. Everybody's running around afraid and wearing their masks um, before COVID shut right, everything right. down, having a meeting with Dr. Pan. And he's like, oh, this is right. You're so right. We have to look at this. And um, then everything shut down and then COVID came and everybody loved our great idea. And then COVID overshadowed it all. But it's something that we would like to reemerge mm -hmm. and, and talk to the legislature and policymakers and others and say, hey, you know, as we look at how can we fix the Medi-Cal program, not just throw money at it, because I'm you know, I'm not into just throwing money, you know, throw it towards a specific purpose to try to do some good. We think this social complexity adjustment would be good because then the hospitals that are providing the, the preponderance of that socially complex care can get a social complexity adjustment right. and help offset kind of the penalty that people call it for caring for those populations. So that's kind of how homelessness of affects one of the ways that it affects right. um, hospitals. It's interesting. So like, you know, uh, electricity is a public utility. Mm -hmm. Water is a public utility. I'm an electricity company. I want to raise rates. I got to go to public utility commission, uh, kind of prove it out. But there's, I guess, an understanding that PG&E has to make money. Like you guys have to charge rates. You guys have to pay your shareholders and so forth. 
doesn't seem like there's an understanding of hospitals that you guys have to make money. I know. What, what can you guys do to, to raise rates so that you can attract doctors to actually work on Medi-Cal patients? So we can't raise rates because Medi-Cal sets the rate and Medicare for the federal government sets the there's rate. There's no petition so to raise we, Medi-Cal rates. Yeah. There's um, no, like, we can go to the legislature mm-hmm. and ask for money and they just say we're broke. We have no money. Especially this year, right? Yeah. yeah. And last year and, and all last, during COVID. So last COVID. year they had 80, 80 billion sur- oh, it's surplus. We got nothing. Oh. I'm going to tell you something that folks won't like me saying this out loud, but I don't care. I say it anyways. So um, we have this funding program for hospitals in California that actually I created back in 2009. It's called the Hospital Fee Program. And it was a new, unconventional way of um, getting more money to the hospitals in California where the hospitals put up their own money as a tax mm-hmm. or as a fee. Um, And then that draws down the federal matching funds and then the hospitals get that money back because the state was unwilling to put their own money up to draw the federal money down. But the feds were saying, we're willing to pay you, you know, up to this amount and the state just isn't. So we said, well, we'll put our own money up to draw that down. So we did that. And then in 2014, we passed a ballot initiative, Prop 52, to make it permanent and to kind of lock in the protections because we didn't want the legislature coming and taking the money, um, you know, after we put the deal together. So this program has been in effect since 2009. And part of the deal in the program is um, the the state gets um, a 20 percent share a 24% share of whatever the net gain is to hospitals. So in the early days, you know, we were getting a net gain of like a billion dollars a year, but now it's grown. We're getting $5 billion a year in new federal money. We're putting up over $5 billion of our own money to draw that down. Mm -hmm. Um, And the state, the 20%, the state, 24%, percent the state gets is a billion dollars a year. So not only are we putting up the money to draw it down, we are paying the state general fund over a billion dollars a year. Oh, wow. And we paid them every year during COVID. Can you believe it? During COVID, they didn't give hospitals a dime, but hospitals was pay- were paying the state a billion dollars a year out of that. We call it the rake off mm-hmm. in the hospital fee program. So there are all kinds of little things like that that I think need to be cleaned right. up and reexamined and looked at. Um, crazy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So m- there was a big push for single payer. Yeah. And no one really understood that was. But then there was like Medi-Cal for all. Um, everyone have Medi-Cal. We, we're all into this together. It's going to fix all our problems. Um, and that died down, didn't go anywhere. And then last year they were like, well... We didn't give Medi-Cal for all, but everyone's covered now. So everyone's covered, uh, but we still have this kind of wonky system. What's your thoughts on on single payer? Uh, will that fix the issue? Well, if single payer, it depends on what it's based on. Um, what are my benefits going to be? Are they going to look like Medi-Cal benefits or are they going to look like the benefits that I've grown accustomed to? Um, so I think everybody's own individual perception of it will be, you know, how is it going to change from what I have today? Is it going to be better or worse? Mm -hmm. And for probably over half the people in the state, it might be worse. If it's better, then that's going to be really expensive healthcare. And it's probably going to be more expensive than they're spending now. So I don't know how the state can pay for it. They never say really expensive healthcare for all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like you know, I think it's not education, fin- right? Yeah. Like you can have public yeah. education. You guys yeah. look at the same thing, and if you yeah. want something a little better, you have to go pay for it. Yeah. I think it's not financially feasible to have um, highly accessible, equitable health care under the state's umbrella. I don't think they could afford to do it. Um, it would be a, an extremely complex mm-hmm. financing structure that. The insurance industry would have to kick in and pay, and I I don't see it happening. So, you know, there's 50 other states. Mm-hmm. You know, you've been in this for a while. I'm sure you see other states that might be doing something that works. Uh, kind of what's what states doing something right that you know you think we should emulate? Yeah. So, um, 
California is unlike most of the other states, just by nature of our geography. Mm -hmm. You know, the other states across the country are like this rectangle and they're smaller. Right. And so it's easier to manage. I think it's difficult for California to just have like one thing for the whole state. But what I think could work um, are kind of regions of care. Um, And I would like to see more population health focused care where you bring in the physicians and the clinics and the primary care and specialty care and hospitals all into one. And everybody gets paid based on the health of that population. How healthy did you keep that population? You know, everybody gets the access they need. They get the care they need, the preventative care they need, the acute care if something like the leg break happens. And then you measure the the care and the outcome of that population. And that's how the money should be spent, not on per widget, per volume. And everybody has to work together and everybody has to share in the success or failure together. And that way everybody, it's got to be driven by the money. It's got to be driven by the money. And that'll make it difficult. uh, I remember it's interesting, you know, I worked on an issue with the innovation fund and you're learning there's billions of dollars sitting there that just can't get awarded anywhere because they don't qualify. And you have all these counties, you have some counties that are very big land wise, but very small population wise. Uh, and they're just trying to get money, but the money doesn't necessarily go to something valuable, right? It could go to another admin or something. Yeah. You know, people are just spending money just to, to ensure that the money stays there, that they can access it yeah. again. Um, kind of, how, how do you solve some of these issues where you have money in different places? Like, I don't know, we just had a proposition on the ballot, uh, but that is actually spent on things that we actually need to actually help people. Yeah, I think it's going to be complex because. You have to get everybody to sit down at a table, everybody who's involved, sit down at a table and really sketch out, you know, what what is the road to fixing this? What is the Mm -hmm. road to getting it towards what we see as kind of an optimum way to provide care or pay for it or all these things? Um, And you have um, kings with bags of money. And they all come and sit at the table and everybody's told you got to put your bag of money in the middle. And then we're all going to agree on how to split that bag of money. I think that's difficult for people to do. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. I was talking to a former member the other day and he was like, you know, there's no new law in this state that we need. And he's like, what really needs to be the focus is oversight. Like we have so much stuff going on. We have so many laws we've already created, so many systems and no one's really paying attention to, is it really working how it should? Um, kind of, who is taking a role in looking at kind of hospitals in California and, and kind of how to fix this mess? Um, so I don't think anybody's um, trying to fix this mess, but there is a new entity that was created by a new law a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and a new bureaucracy that's being formed. Um, it's called H. It's through HCI, um, and it's it's called the Office of Healthcare Affordability, and it is a body that is supposed to determine how much hospitals should spend, how much rate of growth they should have in their expenses. Um, And if they miss those targets, what's the penalty going to be? What's their, um, how are they going to mitigate this? How are they going to get back on track? Um, and, And they're already talking about setting targets. So you can't grow, your expenses can't grow more than, I think the number is around 3% right now. Okay, well, a law just passed that minimum wage has to be 25. Mm -hmm. And hospitals are faced with a $100 billion bill expense over the next 10 years to be seismically compliant. Well, over the next six years by 2030. So if my expenses can only raise 3%, and if they raise more than that, you're going to penalize me and you're going to do something to me, which I don't even know what that is yet, yet you're mandating that I... Um, can function, fully function after an earthquake, and you're mandating that I have to pay employees at a minimum $25 an hour, and I can't grow expenses 3%. Um, Somebody's not connecting the dots. It's kind of interesting. It seems like, you know, basically you guys are expected to bend until you break. Yeah. And we're not going to help you until you break. Right. Is that kind of... That's well, that's what's happened, you know, and that's what happened. And they threw $150 million at the problem. Right. Which is it? 
It no, sounds like a lot, right? It, yeah, but when those hospitals lost eight hundred and sixty-four million dollars last year, I mean, and I don't want to be, you know, ungrateful for the gesture that was made, but like I said, you know, a handful of hospitals got some interim lending, some loans that mm-hmm. just helped them make their payroll and kind of get back on their feet. But it 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 was a band aid on a gunshot wound. All right. It, it's interesting. Um, you know, there's a, there's a constant discussion about COVID, right? Oh yeah. During COVID, everyone moved, and yeah. they thought, "Hey, we can we don't have to live in the city anymore. We can live near Yosemite. We can live yeah. in all these different places." So you have this great kind of migration across the state where people are moving into more kind of rural areas or, or people areas where they don't really have hospitals. And people aren't really thinking of, <laughs> thinking about this until they, there's a problem, right? Um, can you kind of, I guess, talk about, is there, have you guys noticed that migration and are your, I guess, rural hospitals or, um, hospitals and I guess communities that weren't really seeing that many people are now seeing more people and is that causing any issues? Not really seeing that in the hospitals. Um, I think a lot of the migration was, um, less urban, more suburban, a fringe of rural, Mm -hmm. But we are fortunate to have hospitals even in rural areas, but they aren't being inundated by like this new influx of folks that are working remote. I think we saw a lot of the remote go like real remote, like Mm -hmm. out of state, Um, because we're not seeing that kind of an influx. They might like to have that kind of an influx because those people have jobs and commercial insurance and they would get paid more than (laughs) just seeing the typical, you know, Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal employee. And we're not seeing... um, positive influx in the rural and outlying area. So it must not be enough to move the dial. Yeah. You know, one common thing you always see, and especially with kind of social media, someone will go to the hospital for something rather benign, simple. Maybe they bump their head. Uh, they get a CAT scan or something like that. They're discharged. Yes. No issues. And they'll get the bill, bill in yes. the mail and they'll, they'll show it on social media. They'll be like, how did this cost $100,000? Um, what? How, how, why are hospital costs so expensive? <sighs> So those are not, you know, and this is a pet peeve of mine. Uh And before I joined Peach, I actually spent 13 years at California Hospital Association. I represented all hospitals in the state. And one of the things I did while I was there was I created, I even wrote a little book on modern pricing, I called it, Um, how hospitals can change their pricing structure and get rid of the $15 Tylenol. Right. Or the hundred thousand dollar MRI or right. whatever you know, all that other um, prices are very different than cost. So, like your Starbucks cup, that you, the price you paid was three dollars. It probably cost Starbucks a dollar. I'm giving them the benefit of right. the doubt. It probably was less than that, um, but. You got the receipt that said three bucks. And so you look at it like, oh, my gosh, this is three bucks. And that's kind of when people look at their medical bills. It's like, look at that. That's the price. And it it bears zero resemblance to the cost. The reason for that is decades of federal health policy that has driven up the prices people have to pay. Uh, or, or not people have to pay, that that show up on the bill, that the hospital has to bill everybody the same price no matter what. Um, they have to bill the Medicare patient the same price and the self-insured per- person the same price. Everybody has to get the same price tag, like that Starbucks receipt. And the reason for that is Medicare decades ago used to be a cost-based reimbursement So you would basically send in this report saying, hey, Medicare, this is what it cost me to provide the care. And then Medicare would pay you the cost. And then they said, and then Medicare said, hmm, we don't think we should pay you the cost. We're going to disallow some cost and we're going to cut some other things. And so hospitals were like, well, the only way I'm going to um, get more, get a raise from Medicare is if I increase my prices based on this cost to charge ratio. So they started upping the prices, even though their costs were the same, and then their payment based on the price would be closer to the cost. And this kind of game went on for a while and Mm -hmm. it created the so-called, and I'm simplifying it, but created the so-called, you know, $15 aspirin that exists today. And to unwind four decades of policy 
would be really, really hard. It can be done and hospitals can do it if they want to work really hard. It would cost them a lot of money to do it and it would take a lot of time. Um, but would it really satisfy the public? I don't know. So not many have done it. A couple of hospitals I know did it and tried or at least made improvements, but it's really difficult to do. Yeah, because someone always goes to like another country. They'll go to like the Netherlands and be like, oh, I got this cast for like $15. Exactly. Yeah. I know. But they had completely different policies that was driving that. Right. Yeah. That's because funny. even though, you know, the bill says, you know, $15,000 or something, the hospital really got paid probably about 4000 it's it's this stupid hospital financing accounting stuff and that they charge what they don't receive and they have this big item on their income statements called deductions from revenue and they just minus everything in there that they don't get paid. Right. It's just silly, crazy accounting. That's interesting. So I, I'm on a bank board and recently we were looking for a new CEO. Yeah. We did a nationwide search and it was interesting. A lot of the bank CEOs are also involved in hospitals, hospital CEOs. Um, you know, what was your path to becoming, I guess, a CEO in kind of this kind of hospital world? So you're not going to believe it, but I started out in banking. <laughs> <laughs> I had to laugh when you said that. Yeah, so like my first real job, yeah. you know, and I was working on my master's degree and stuff, and I got hired at a community bank. I lived up in Calaveras County. Mm -hmm. And I got hired at a community bank and I worked in the loan department, putting loans together and all this. And, right. you know, and they figured out I was kind of smart, knew what I was doing and I was educated and I had gone to school and they're like, oh, we want you to come over here. And then I became the accountant for the bank, doing the bank's actual financial statements and stuff. And eventually I became the, the bank's um, vice president and chief financial officer. Um, for six branches throughout Amador, Calaveras, and Tuolumne County. It was a $100 million community bank mm -hmm. in the foothills. Um, and our pet charity in town was the hospital. And so I served on the hospital's of fundraising board right. foundation and was very involved when they would get new doctors come to town the doctors would come to the bank and the bankers would set them up with lines of credit and checking accounts and all that so it's just funny how that how that worked right. um and then when i decided to leave banking what did i do i went to work for a hospital <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know it's just kind of crazy but if you know you always think like oh hospitals are run by doctors yeah, they aren't. And they're not. <laughs> no. And hospitals can't even employ them. Really? They don't employ the doctors. They, you know, can woo doctors into the community, but doctors have mm -hmm. to set up their own practice. They bill their own patients. They, you know, do all that and they get credentialed to, to work at the hospital. But um, hospitals have no hiring, firing authority and all they can do is make sure they're credentialed. And they have to follow, you know, rules and policies and procedures that the medical director sets up. So the hospital is a building with equipment right. that the physician then comes and uses his, his education and his credentialing to practice in. And they speak to, the, they have their own governing body of physicians that kind of set the policies for medical practice and care. Interesting. So how did you go from... I guess, you know, CEO or working at the local hospital to hospital, you know, politics in Sacramento. And yeah. So it's crazy. Um, so I worked, gosh, I worked for 15 years in hospitals and I started out at Mark Twain St. Joseph's Hospital in San Andreas, California. And that hospital became a part of now Dignity Health, what was mm -hmm. then Catholic Healthcare West. And within the larger system, they said, hey, that Anne over there, I had people fooled. She's kind of sharp. Let's bring her up here. And so then I eventually became part working in the system office in, in Sacramento um, for the Northern California Division doing work there. Um, then I went on maternity leave. And when I was going to go back to work after maternity leave, um, a friend of mine was working at the Poor County Hospital in Stockton in French Camp off of I-5, San mm. Joaquin General. Oh. And she said, I'm going to be leaving. And if you come back to work, you really should come work for this hospital. They need help. They're so poor. They just you need guidance. And it's like this continual improvement program. And I've always been... Um, as a hospital CFO, I was not really kind of like the bean counter accounting type. I was more the 
the fixer, the deal putterer together right. type person. And it was kind of intriguing to me to be able to do that. And so I thought rather than going back to Catholic Healthcare West, which was a great system to work for, this would be kind of a, a challenge that would make it more fun to go back to work. And so I went to work for San Joaquin General and I stayed there for three and a half years. And that's when I really got my taste of um, policy making and the whole policy machine, because back in 2005, the Medi-Cal program went through an extreme overhaul and completely changed the way hospitals got paid, specifically the public hospitals, the county hospitals. And I was very involved with our little trade associations, the California Association of Public Hospitals mm -hmm. that represents the 21 hospitals. So I got very involved with them and went to meetings with them to the Department of Healthcare Services and just got involved. And it's like, this policymaking stuff is kind of cool. <laughs> and um, then I ended up leaving there to work closer to home and went to work for UC Davis Medical Center, which was also part of the public hospital system, but just on a bigger scale and bigger numbers. And then I, I was not looking for it. I didn't plan it. I saw that California Hospital Association was hiring for vice president of finance policy. And I'm like, I could like do this policy stuff for all the hospitals in the state. And I interviewed and got hired, and I had the absolute privilege and pleasure of getting to work for 11 years shoulder to shoulder with Dwayne Donner, who was the CEO, long, long time CEO of California Hospital Association before he retired. Oh, I guess it's been like a half a dozen years now. Right. So. And then you jumped over to Peach. And then I just jumped to Peach um, four years ago. Um, I had been at CHA for 13 years, did some phenomenal stuff, created the hospital fee program with Dwayne and um, did the ballot initiative. That was cool stuff to work on. Right. Loved doing that with Dwayne and just many other things that we did, um, multiple kind of books and catalogs and resources for hospitals that we wrote on charity care and the modern pricing and um, population health management and my forte has always been putting together deals on Medi-Cal to get more resources for that population in those hospitals. So I always had a knack for kind of the safety net side of things. Um, so when the Peach CEO was going to retire and that position became open, it's like, you know, this might be a good last place to work before I decide to retire. And so, and they were already my members at CHA because most of them have membership at CHA right. and at Peach. And so when they said, oh, Anne's going to come work for Peach, they all seemed celebratory and they still keep me around. And I just am passionate about helping them. I think because I came from the trenches, mm -hmm. I really understand the challenges that they have. So um, I love what I do and I love to provide real help to those hospitals because I know they need it. And um, yes, I know the hospital needs to work as a field in unity together, but you know, these, these safety net hospitals, they need more help. And I don't mind being that loud voice for them. It's interesting. So, you know, I, I, you see all this stuff with the budget season coming in. <clears throat> uh, the budget when I think like Gavin Newsom took over in 2016, 60, 69, I guess. Now it's like, Four times as big I know. or five times as big. It's crazy. And, and during that span, um, you think you would, your members would have received more money through this ever expanding budget. What you're saying is they haven't got any more money. Mm -mm. So we've had this huge budget expansion. Yeah. Uh, you guys didn't win anything in it. No. And now here we are in this huge contraction. Yeah. Um, what are you guys facing in, in this kind of this budget um, and these potential cuts coming up? So I think nothing because. You never had anything. No. <laughs> No, because Dwayne and I, when we did the ballot initiative in 2014 with the help of a really smart attorney, Tom Hiltak, um, we included a provision in the ballot initiative that says as long as this hospital fee program is in place, mm -hmm. which the state loves because we pay them a billion dollars a year out of it, as long as it's in place, the legislature cannot cut medical rates. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. And that's in the Constitution now. 
So it's kind of like uh, Prop 98 for the schools. Right? Kind of. Yeah. But you have to remember the fee program is our own money. Right. I mean, we put up the money to draw down the federal money. So we just get the new federal money. Mm -hmm. But it still leaves like a $7 billion hole right. that the state, we've become a huge crutch for the state. We are letting them wash their hands of a $7 billion responsibility right. in Medi-Cal. So kind of earlier, you kind of talked about the, the nonprofits and the for-profits. And basically, you know, you have, you have one side making, you know, billions of dollars, one side losing money. Um, I guess, how, how do you make this whole? How, how do you make these peach hospitals whole uh, so that they're at least break even? Yep. Because you so, said, you, you know, you just can't throw money at the problem, but nope, you kind of do, I, right? But I've got, a, I've got a list of what yeah. needs to happen. Um, and the first thing that needs to happen is the 13-year freeze on Medi-Cal rates needs to stop. And there needs to be a concerted effort to increase those rates to be equal to as if they would have grown by inflation mm -hmm. every year. Okay, and why, why is that not happening? Because the legislature has to make it happen and nobody has nobody. said that it's important enough. And none of, none of the, the players, the doctors, the nurses? The doctors get different rates CMA. than hospitals. They, they have their own fights they and they've care. gotten, they get, they got a lot of the MCO money. Mm. Um, but hospitals don't because, because there is this misconception that, oh, hospitals have the fee program, which we do. We have the fee program, but it's just become a bigger and bigger hole that should have been filled with state general fund that's mm -hmm. paid out of our own pocket. So we need to increase the Medi-Cal rates. And then the very next thing that we absolutely need to do, we need to change that 24% rake off of the hospital fee program. We need to stop paying over a billion dollars a year in healthcare resources to the state general fund. We need to keep those resources mm -hmm. in the Medi-Cal program. And then the third thing we need to do, we need to start weaning out these self-funded programs. Um, the public hospitals have them too. It's the, the state is just washing their hands of any responsibility. And they say, if you want new money, you have to put up the money to draw down the federal funds. And so hospitals have been doing that, but it's grown so large, the amount of money that we're putting up is really the responsibility right. of the state. We have to start weaning those programs back down to a more manageable size. So, and you, then one more thing. Yeah. So 2030, we're supposed to like every hospital is supposed to like function like a mini city and have all the services and sewer and water and everything intact after an earthquake. And that's going to cost $100 billion to be compliant. Um, even if you're not in an earthquake area. Yes. Yeah, okay. As long as you are in California, even if you aren't on a fault or near a mm -hmm. fault, and if you don't even feel any trim, it, right. it's all, um, there needs to be some modification. Maybe it's just for emergency services, not the whole darn hospital. Maybe there needs to be some funding. Um, in the past, there have been some ballot initiatives that have given grants to children's hospitals for their spending, well, why not the safety net hospitals? Right. Um, I think that something needs to happen because the only alternative to not being compliant is closure. So those all sound like pretty common sense things. <laughs> that you could just that walk across. You could just get like a list and walk across. <laughs> and what you always learn is, is you know, you take something like this little member's office. And yeah. Like, this is a great idea, Ann. Thanks yeah. for joining us. They always yeah. ask, who's going to be opposed to this? I know. Who is going to be opposed to these things? Yeah, a, a whole list of of folks that generally are opposed to things hospitals want to do. We have a bill this year. Mm -hmm. Peach has a bill this year um, that you'd think would be the easiest thing in the world. We want to create a state definition of a safety net hospital. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's officially opposed yet, but we anticipate there will be some. So we're looking at maybe doing some alternative things instead of that. Yeah. There is a new select committee um, that was just appointed in the legislature and assembly member um, Soria is the chair. And um, we hope to be working very closely with that committee to try to address some of these safety net issues that have to be addressed. Um, because it, I don't know that our definition is going to, it's like we can't get a definition. It's like, so I have no hope for my other list. 
Um, well, it seems like, you know, often when like an industry, you know, compounds on a third rail issue, it just can't get it done. Often you have to go to the voters, right? That's something yeah. you guys already have yeah. done. Is that something you guys yeah. are talking about again in a um, few years? We aren't talking about it yet. Um, but if we really, the seismic thing might be an opportunity. Yeah. Seems like, you know, you have a billion yeah. dollars. You could either spend a year there. Yeah. <laughs> could yeah. Fix- and fix some things. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Well, always great learning a, a new industry. Thank you so much yeah. for taking the time to Thank talk to us. Thank you for having us. me. Uh, fascinating conversation. If some of our listeners want to learn more about you or or your association, kind of where can they find you? They can find me at peachhospitals.org. Go to our website and all of our contact information is there. They can call me. They can email me peachhospitals.org. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Anne. And uh, best of luck in solving all these problems. You got plenty of work to do. All right. Thanks. (laughs) 